<clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome uh, back to some uh, Flint Walling virtual training. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how to ohm out a, a jet or centrifugal uh, pump motor. By the way, my name is Dan Painter, and I am the product training and development manager at Flint Walling, and we'll be hosting today's uh, web conference. Uh, so with that, um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Again, we're going to be talking about how to use a multimeter to ohm out uh, jet and centrifugal pump motors, but I thought I would take a few t minutes while people are still coming into this uh, platform. Uh, I want to point out a few uh, uh, motor facts that particularly pertain to the F&W motor. Um, number one, Flint Walling, and I'm not sure everybody knows this, but Flint Walling manufactures their own jet and centrifugal pump motors. Uh, we manufacture these from a uh, half horsepower up to three horsepower, both in single phase and three phase. So we are a self-manufacturing of our own motor. And that said, uh, we're actually the only pump company in North America that can stake that claim uh, that we manufacture on jet and centrifugal motors. We've been doing this since the 50s. Anybody that comes up for a factory tour gets to see uh, that manufacturing process. Uh, every rotor, uh, we die cast our own rotors, so I want you to know every rotor, which is the, the portion of the motor back here, it's, it's the rotor, it's the portion that turns, right? It's the portion that turns. I want you to know that we balance every one of those 100%, and then the rotor is held in place. You'll see this in some ensuing slides, but the rotor is held in place, both front and back, uh, with two large, oversized, uh, self-lubricating uh, stainless steel ball bearings. That all said, this, uh, this motor runs very, very quiet. Of course, every motor is going to be factory tested, 100% every motor. Um, I've got a little an animation that jumped in uh, ahead of the line here I see down there. But anyway, I want to talk to you a little bit about service factor. Uh, this is uh, pretty uh, good information to know. This, uh, this typically is a nameplate label that goes on the back of our motors, okay? It'll give you the model number <clears throat> and all the pertinent information that has to do with that motor. What I'd like to talk to you about here for just a minute or two is what's called service factor, sometimes abbreviated with just the SF, as you see. And what I'd like to uh, talk to you about uh, when it comes to service factor is if we look at this particular nameplate motor, it's rated at three-quarter horsepower. Everybody see that? Okay, I've got a red box around it. If we scroll through the data, we'll come to service factor. And uh, if we look at that three-quarter horse motor, the service factor is 1.5. All right? So here's what I'd like to make sure you understand about service factor and how it plays into a role of a pump motor or an overall performance for that matter. And that's this. You take the horsepower times the service factor, and that's going to give you an indication as to how much of the copper windings went into that motor. So when you've got a service factor of 1.5, like you see on the screen, the uh, copper windings in that motor are pretty robust. And when you do that math, you multiply that three-quarter horse times the service factor of 1.5, what you're getting, even though it's a nameplate three-quarter horse, even though you purchased a three-quarter horse motor, uh, the reality is that you've got a motor that's uh, capable of producing over a little over one horsepower. And so flint and walling motors all have relatively high service factors. Uh, compared, if you go into, you know, some of the retail stores, uh, a lot of those motors will simply be a 1.0 service factor. So again, that makes the math real easy. Uh, there is no advantage. Uh, in that service factor. So, all right, just a couple of, uh, just a thing. All of our motors are dual voltage. I want to show you how to change that voltage. Um, uh, so they're going to be either 115 or 230 volt. Most of the jet pumps probably leave at 115 volt factory set. Most of the centrifugals, if not all, are going to leave factory set at 230 volt. But irrespective, if you want to change the voltage on a flint walling motor, it's it's uh, it's pr pretty easy to do. Uh, you're going to take these two cover screws off the back of the motor cover. So there's this back motor cover, 
and there's uh, two uh, screws that hold that in place. So you take those two screws out. Again, right here they are. This label is also on the pump uh, body itself, but it's a, basically a wiring diagram. So let me kind of walk you through this real quick, okay? So up on the screen is a 230 volt single phase uh, wiring diagram, and right next to it is a 115 volt single phase wiring diagram. And so when you take the cover, this cover here, and you remove it from the back of that motor, you're gonna be looking at a terminal block that looks very similar to the one I have up here on the screen, all right? Now, if you look at this terminal block closely, I gotta move my uh, dashboard out of the way so I can also look at it more closely. Uh, if you look at terminal B here, all right? I've got my highlighter on terminal B. That, when I look, if I take the cover off the back of the motor and I see a gray and a red wire on terminal B, uh, that's an indication right off the bat to me that this motor has been wired for 230 volt. Now, if I want to change that voltage, if, uh, you know, either way, whether you want to go, you know, from 115 to 230 or from uh, 230 back to 115, all right, um, you can grab a pair of needle nose pliers and you take this gray wire off the B terminal and move it to A. You take the red wire off the B terminal and move it to the right, to L2. So it looks like the diagram on the right-hand side of your screen. That's all there is to changing the voltage of this motor. And yet, I've had, you know, I've had some people, you know, complain a little bit that they feel like maybe this is a little too cumbersome. Uh, there are other manufacturers out there with dials and slide switches, and I've talked to contractors about those. And I'm going to tell you something, as far as my poll results, uh, they're not, those things have not been flawless either. Where, you know, if the switch doesn't switch, now what? You know, if the dial doesn't actually make the, the, the voltage change, now what do you do? Where here, you know, with a pair of needle nose pliers, again, I can, I can probably perform this operation in less than probably a minute just to take that back cover off and mo move those two wires. But that's how you do that on a flint and walling motor is you move the, uh, the blue wire off the B to the A, and the red wire off the B to the L2 over here on this side. So you're basically taking these two and moving them away from each other. Let's not uh, forget these are all, of course, air-cooled motors, unlike their counterparts of submersible pump motor, which is water-cooled. These are all air-cooled motors, and it's pretty important um, when we look at, you know, what can cause situations that would create a heat rise, okay? A heat rise. Well, obviously, ambient temperatures can do that. And when we look at the ambient temperatures uh, rating of a motor, uh, basically, the ambient temperature rating for an electric motor uh, is the maximum surrounding uh, temperature that the motor can operate in without overheating. And, of course, that will in turn reduce, uh, will uh, thus, overheating was gonna reduce the lifespan and life of the motor. But the ambient temperature rating is based on this comment right here, the maximum surrounding temperature that the motor can operate in without overheating, okay? So I wanna talk a little bit about that now. Um, inside this motor is a cooling fan, and uh, you're gonna see that cooling fan way up front here where I've got the yellow box around that, uh, cooling fan up there. Uh, here it is again, and I think both images. So I got a couple images of some cutaway motors. You can see where the cooling fan sits. Um, and the whole notion, obviously, of an air-cooled motor is for that cooling fan. It has a, you know, its sole purpose, quite frankly, is to dissipate heat away from those copper windings, to move that heat and uh, vent it right out the back of the, um, the motor. Now, uh, I will say this, that we do construct our uh, fans out of metal. Uh, we construct them out of metal. Again, you know, it makes sense that this is an air-cooled motor and you get into a heat rise situation. You got a plastic motor fan in there? Here's the problem with plastic motor fans is when you get into high heat situations, as you and I know, plastic is a material that can uh, begin to soften up and distort. And of course, if that happens, you're going you're gonna to kick out on thermal overload. You're going to overheat every time because you're not efficiently able to cool that motor. 
Um, die cast rotor, that's the one that's in the middle. That's the one I mentioned earlier on. I'm just, all I'm trying to do is identify some components here on this motor, folks, so that when we start talking about using multimeters and I reference a component, uh, it's not going to, uh, it's going to be something that uh, has been shared with you already. So that, that's the die cast rotor. Uh, we we die cast that rotor at our uh, factory. Um, that's in there. The two stainless steel oversized ball bearings, one sits up just in front of the fan right there. And the other one uh, sits right behind the rotor in a, uh, a casing in that uh, casting there, right there. So those are, again, two oversized uh, stainless steel ball bearings. Also, you can look in and you can actually see the stator windings. These are the copper windings. And this is what we need to keep cool. We need to dissipate heat away from these windings in order to have an efficiently uh, running motor. And then if we look at the back of the motor, all right, all the way to the back, there's several things back here. Uh, there's a capacitor uh, that sits inside the back cover, all right? It's not internal to the motor body itself, but sits just outside under the back cover. There's a capacitor there. Uh, there's a thermal overload, again, that, um, uh, and there's the uh, terminal block. Uh, there's a switch on the back side of that terminal block I'm going to show you, and then there's a governor that operates that switch. So we're going to look at these components here just uh, briefly. Um, but I also want to talk about our rear motor cover. Um, it's designed, you know, what it is and, and what it isn't, okay? So hopefully this makes sense to you. Um, but when we look at these air-cooled motors, all right, we're not arbitrarily going to be blowing hot air across that capacitor, any dust, dirt, or debris. We're not blowing any of that garbage through this area back here on the back side of the motor where they uh, are positioned. So if you look at the bottom right-hand side of your screen, you'll see how that back motor is designed. So you can see the venting portion of that motor is all underneath, right? All underneath this bottom portion here. And again, the whole purpose behind this design was that we don't uh, blow dust and debris and heat across those components. We want all that air all that hot air to be exiting out the bottom portion of our motor. Uh, so when we look at the ambient temperatures, for example, when we go back to these real quick, ambient temperatures for most of our competitors, most of our competitors' mo motors, and again, most of our competitors don't build or manufacture their own motors. They're all sourced. But these are the ambient temperature ratings. Uh, some of them are out there at 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Others are out there at 122 degrees F. Uh, most of the ambient temperatures you'll see on the motor label, however, will be red in Celsius. Uh, but when we look at the ambient temperature ratings for that F&W motor, uh, we do come in uh, pretty superior to our competitors. So again, we've done a great job of keeping this motor efficiently cooled um, in a variety of conditions and operations. What that rear motor cover is, <coughs> excuse me, Excuse me, what that rear motor cover is, uh, if you see how it's designed, all right, this is looking at the side of the, you know, the, the motor, this is what it looks like. It was not, however, designed to be a lift point on the back side of this pump and motor assembly. I just want you to know that. It looks like it should have been, and it darn near, it's convenient enough, but folks, I wouldn't want to trust a pump that's going to weigh 50, 60, 70, or more pounds that these two screws uh, are going to keep that cover on the back of that motor. So I, I would hate to think that those things pop out of there for whatever reason, just because of the sheer weight. It's not a lifting point. All right, let's now switch gears and uh, we'll start. I just want to cover a few of those uh, motor uh, things up front because, uh, again, a lot of people, I don't think, realize, A, that Flint Walling makes their own motors, and B, um, many people don't actually get inside these motors, so I thought I'd take the time to share with you some of the things that are inside. So when we talk about testing these motors, and, and again, uh, this is going to be very fundamental. Um, and by the way, the thought just crossed, crossed my mind. I have, just for your information, if you look at your dashboard, and I'm not asking that you necessarily do this right now, but if it's on my mind right now, so I'm going to share it. If you scroll down your dashboard, you'll see a, a little tab called handouts. Handouts, and I've attached a couple of handouts to today's presentation so that you don't have to take notes, okay? So that you won't have to take notes. But obviously, 
uh, when we're going to be determining the health and welfare of a centrifugal or a jet motor, uh, the first thing we're going to want to do is disconnect the power to the motor, right? We're going to disconnect the power to the motor. And then the second thing we'll do is we're going to remove those motor screws in the back. Uh, that's the same place where we were switching the voltage earlier slides. Uh, but we're going to take those two screws out. And we're going to remove that uh, back motor cover. Now, <clears throat> the thing that we're going to do now is we're going to check, again, we're going to check that voltage selection and make sure the leads are, are connected properly, right? So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy to do. And if you understand what I shared earlier with these gray and red wires, a quick visual, just open that cover up, and we're going to need to be in there anyway, but a quick visual of making sure by looking at these two diagrams, <clears throat> at least we know what the motor's wired for, right? It's either going to be wired for 230 volt or 115. All right. Uh, and then the other thing that we want to make sure is the power cord coming in, right? Make sure it's routed properly. So we want to con check the conditions of the lead to make sure that we've got these routed properly. And we're, we're coming in on line one and line two, as you see here, L1, L2. But again, that's just a very quick visual inspection. Uh, to disregard it and miss it, uh, it, it takes you a while to get back to this point, so you might as well knock it off uh, right up front. So again, when you take that uh, back motor cover off, the first thing you're going to be looking at is uh, this terminal block here. And again, here's your L1 and your L2, so here's your lines coming in. And then you've got uh, the A and B terminal up here that we were talking about earlier, but this is your terminal block, okay? This is where all the, the capacitor and the thermal overload, that's what that, they get wired into. But it's also, if you see, it says terminal block and switch. If we were to take that terminal block and flip it upside down, and by the way, you can take that terminal block off, and I might reference this in a future slide, but there's two uh, hex screws right here and right here where my cursor's hovering back and forth. If you put a nut driver on there, uh, um, take those two screws out, that whole terminal block will be freed up. And you can take it and flip it over, and on the back side, you're going to see this switch right here. I think I've got a little better view of that. There you go. So there's a switch, and it's got some contacts in there, right? All pump motors have these things. At least the single-phase pump motors have these. They're all of different designs, but there will be a switching mechanism on the back of these, these uh, centrifugal motors. And the reason behind that switch mechanism is that is what allows the motor to start off in the start windings and then quickly uh, 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 transition to the run windings or the main windings. And that's what that switch does. Now, how does that switch operate? Again, back here on the back of this motor is a governor, all right? And that's what the governor looks like right here, all right? This actually, uh, this governor actually is affixed to the back of the rotor shaft. So this thing's spinning along with the rotor underneath that black cover, it's spinning. And what, what happens is in the idle position, all right, in the off position, this governor will actually be pressing down on that rubber boot. And when it presses down on that rubber boot, these contacts are, are mated, okay? They're mated. And that's how the pump's going to be in the off idle position. So the moment that pump fires up, it's in the start windings by, by virtue of these, this contact being made here. But in a very short period of time, I'm talking a fraction of a second, you see this governor spring loaded. And as this thing spins, uh, the governor will pop up. And when it pops up, the boot pops up. And when the boot pops up, we break the contact over here. And now we are in the run windings. So it's important that that switch functions uh, and functions at the time it's supposed to. Uh, I think, again, we've done a pretty good job now over the years with that back switch. But just, again, wanted to show you where that's located. Uh, the thermal overload, you see it kind of pictured on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. The thermal overloads, uh, because of the wiring that's on this image, it's a little more difficult to see it. But it sits where my arrow's pointing. It's, it's got a couple of screws that actually holds it to the back motor plate. And there'll be three wires. Uh, uh, running to if it's a dual voltage motor, there'll be three wires running to that thermal overload a, a, a red, a black, a red, yellow, and white. So, anyway, uh, that's where the thermal overload is located. So, again, the whole 
notion behind this motor is that all that airflow that comes in travels out the bottom portion of that motor and it kind of keeps this top portion where everything we've just talked about is in a lot more pristine condition uh, due to not a lot of heat, dust, and debris. All right, so when we're going to test this motor, <clears throat> one of the first things that we uh, would test is we're going to check the uh, continuity of the overload, all right, of the thermal overload. We're going to check the continuity of that. Now, on dual voltage motors, and I mentioned this in the previous slide, uh, there'll be three leads coming off that uh, thermal overload. There'll be a yellow, a black, and a white. And again, most all flint and walling motors are dual voltage. I suppose there are some single voltage motors out there. If you are happen happening to test a single voltage motor that doesn't have dual voltage capabilities, then there's only going to be two leads on that thermal overload. There'll be a yellow and a black, all right? And again, I've got these all in note form for you so that uh, you don't have to necessarily write this stuff down as we go along, all right? So here's how we test uh, the continuity of an overload. So we're going to set the meter uh, to the uh, continuity symbol right there, all right? You see up here on this, you'll have these different uh, symbols on your multimeter, again, whether it's uh, analog or digital. And so you see this symbol here, continuity, all right? That's what we're checking. We're checking the continuity of this thermal overload. And the way that we do that is we are going to take our multimeter probes and we're going to touch the yellow to the black wire. We're going to touch the yellow to the white wire. And then we're going to touch the black to the white wire. So we've essentially checked every one of these kind of a lead to lead basis, all right? Again, if it's a single phase motor, heh, that's pretty easy. One test, you're done. Uh, yellow to black is all you're going to have. And so the thing that we're looking for, though, uh, when we put our multimeter on these uh, leads off this thermal overload and, and we're set on the uh, continuity, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for a beep, all right? And a lot of these meters have little audible beeps. I know even I got four or five of them, they all beep. You cross those probes, they'll beep. So the meter should beep if the thermal overload is in good condition and you've got good continuity. On the other hand, if it doesn't beep, then it's a bad thermal overload. So when we talk about thermal overloads, uh, we're going to set uh, the meter for continuity, and then we're going to check each lead to lead. If the mo meter beeps, hey, we're good to go. But if there is no beeps, uh, then at that point, we've got a bad overload bad thermal overload. So it's a pretty cut and dry black and white test uh, to do that for the overload. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to move on down, we'll check the overload. I'm going to, when we finish up this conversation, I'm going to go back to the uh, back of that motor. We're going to check that capacitor. It sits back there as well. But right now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and check the motor uh, windings for uh, correct uh, resistance values, okay, for correct resistance values. And to do that, you're going to move your uh, ohm meter over to the uh, ohm uh, logo or symbol. All right, so you're going to get resistance in ohm, ohms. When you set that meter to ohms, um, select that 200 ohm setting. So go ahead and set your meter up on 200 ohms. And then by doing this, uh, we can actually identify uh, various cables and wire colors, uh, just by understanding these resistance values, okay? So it's just an added bonus that, you know, if the wires are all, you know, whatever, they're not, they're not real legible, you can't tell the colors anymore, understanding these resistance values is going to give you a, uh, the indication of what those wires are. So, for example, you got, you got a copy of this that's on your dashboard. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side, single-phase motors, okay? I've only listed, I didn't, we may actually manufacture a third horse, but sell very few. Uh, but I've got it uh, listed here from half through three horsepower. So these are your various horsepower motors. Given the fact they're all 60 hertz uh, and dual voltage, like you see here, not three horsepower obviously is only going to run on 230 volt only. But over here is those values, published values, okay? These are the published values. Uh, they have a little note that says all resistance values in ohms are a plus and minus 15%. So therefore, at 2.1, if I, at the very top of that, if I go plus or minus 15%, what it's going to do is give me a range now that I fall into. If we look down to uh, down at the bottom, 
um, the main resistance right here, the, the main winding resistance or the, the, the run winding resistance, if you will, right here, this column, are going to be your orange and red and your gray and tan. All right, so when you put your probes on the orange and the red lead, depending on horsepower, you ought to be coming in about where these, uh, these uh, resistance values are. Your start windings, your start windings on the other hand, uh, this far right hand column, uh, are going to be based on the readings you get by attaching your probes to the red and purple wire. And again, I've got this all in print for you. So, for example, let's just take a, a one horsepower um, motor, dual voltage, right? And there is our published values, all right? So the main uh, re resistance should be 1.0 and the start uh, resistance should be 4.8, all right? So I've got uh, the horsepower and I know what the value should be. So there they are. Again, I've got a one horsepower. I know that the main uh, resistance is, is 4.8 and the start is uh, 1.0. All right, so let's do a little testing once. And again, as I mentioned earlier, since all those values are in a plus or minus 15%, basically that creates that range. So uh, for example, under the main, uh, even though 4.8 is the published, if you're between four and 5.5, you're within range. Uh, on the start windings, that's uh, 0 0.8 to 1.15. Again, one is the uh, published values, but that's the range based on the 15% plus or minus. All right, let's just do some actual testing now. Uh, just to, we're, we're going to test this motor, and I'm going to go. I'm going to start off uh, at the top. I'm going to put my probes on the orange and the red wire, and when I do. I'm getting the resistance of 4.2 over here in my ohmmeter, all right? Well, 4.2 falls certainly within the range of 4.0 to 5.5, so I give that a good grade. All right, now I'm going to go down and do the same exact test on the gray and the tan wire. Well, once again, I'm showing 4.2 ohms over there in my ohmmeter, and so once again, I would give that a fairly good grade because it's falling within the range of the, uh, the published values. And then when I get over here to the uh, start windings, I'm coming in at 0 0.95 and uh, I'm supposed to be at one, but the range is 0.8 to 0.115. You see, so that, what this is basically telling me is that we've got a pretty good motor, at least up to this point. And this is just an example of if those values are within range, that's always a good thing. That's always a good thing. But again, we're not always testing a good motor. So let's test some bad motors and see if we can figure out what's wrong with them. All right, so here's another one. It's another one horsepower motor. There's your published values, all right? So if I put my probes, again, on that orange and red, I get 4.8. It's within the range. Good gray. Now I move down to the gray and the tan. What am I going to get there? Uh, 4.2. There you go, 4.2. Well, again, that's within range, right? All right, so I'm going to move to my start windings. I'm going to do a test over there on the red and the purple. So in doing that, I come up with, uh-oh, that's not good. You see that? That's not good. Um, that's not within the range. So what I'm going to tell you about this would have pertained whether it was this one or this one that was not within the range. What we're seeing here is that's lower than the published value, right? 0 0.32, that's lower than the published value. That thing's, that, that, that's a failure right there, all right? Because we had values that come in lower, all right? Anytime, anytime you have values that come in lower than the published values. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's on the main or run windings or on the start winding. It doesn't matter. Any one of these values that come in lower than the published. Here's how we can think of this. When resistance values are lower than specified, look at the two stools up there. One's lower than the other. Well, that's because it's short, right? So if you want to shorten the grass, lower the motor. <laughs> so this is just kind of, I know might come across a little uh, corny, but listen, I, you know, I, I use these analogies sometimes uh, for new people, uh, even our own new hires. So again, when the values come in lower, it's an indication of a short. So knowing that the values are lower, um, 
will indicate a short. And actually, we can we can identify that short over here because it's in the start windings, right? These are all right, but the start winding failed. So the short was actually in the start winding there. Okay, moving right along, uh, a short. Uh, we're going to set the, the meter for ohms, right? That's what we're going to set it on, ohms. And then we're going to check each lead to lead, every lead to lead. If we're within range, that's a good motor. That's always good. But if we come in lower, lower than the published values, that's going to indicate a short in that motor. All right, let's move on to another test. Uh, uh, again, this is a, we're going to test another bad motor. We've got our published values up there. This time, uh, when I check this uh, orange and red wire, I'm coming up with 4.6. And that's always passing. That, that, they do a good job of those wires. <laughs> 4.6, I come down. Now I'm going to put my probes on my gray and my tan wire. Uh, that's not good because that's 8.2. I should be at 4.8 or at least between 4 and 5.5, 5, but I'm coming in at 8.2. So that's obviously going to get a bad grade. I'm going to go ahead and continue this test. I'm going to check my uh, my red and purple wires over here on my start windings. And so when I do that test, I'm, there, boy, I'm coming in right spot on, right? One, that's good. So again, um, you got three readings here on dual voltage motors. You're going to have two on your main uh, windings and one on your start windings. And irrespective of which value we get, if one of those values come in lower, that's a short. If one of these values, like we see here, actually comes in higher, well, that's something else. That's not a short, all right? Higher. How do we even, how do we remember this well again another corny analogy i think if i think of high i think there's nothing higher than the sky <laughs> and i walk out and i can look into that great big open sky and so if you have values that are higher it indicates an open winding again that's different from a short so you have a winding that's a, a, what's called an open winding and that will be telltale by values higher than the uh, published values. And again, we can tell or have a pretty good uh, idea of where that winding is open. <laughs> right? Not saying we're going to repair it, but at least it gets us to some kind of a root cause uh, failure yeah. on this thing. So higher, it's an uh, open winding. So open windings, again, we're going to set the meter to ohms. We're going to check lead to lead, just like we do for shorts. And again, within range, the motor's good. But in this case, if the values come in higher than the uh, published range, that motor has open windings, okay? That motor has open windings. All right, now the last thing we're going to do here is, uh, so we've checked the windings, we've checked the thermal overload. Um, you can do a pretty good visual on that switch, quite frankly. Uh, but anyway, now what we're going to do is we're going to check that start capacitor, okay? And um, so to to check the start capacitor, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to uh, disconnect. Again, when you take these two screws loose here and that terminal block comes forward, all right, this screw and that screw and that terminal block comes forward, the capacitor, which sits right behind it, right here, is very, very accessible. All right, very, very accessible. Um, so the uh, caution here, though, the caution, when testing a capacitor, we need to use a little caution. Avoid touching the terminals with your hands or fingers. I'm talking about the terminals right on that capacitor. Uh, if the capacitor is, is not dead, or if it's not bad, it still may have a full charge in it, okay? And <laughs> I've talked to people that got to experience that firsthand, and it's not very pleasant at all. So again, use caution when check, testing a capacitor that you don't place your fingers uh, right on the terminals at the end of the capacitor itself. So again, you're going to remove those two uh, terminal uh, screws and, and take that terminal block off. This is what the capacitor will look like. It sits behind. You see the terminals here, right? You see the two terminals there. Avoid the touching those. And actually, not a bad idea to take a – how I used to start my car back when I was 16 years old. But anyway, I look at uh, – discharge the capacitor uh, using a, a screwdriver with an insulated handle. Uh, you touch both those uh, terminals simultaneously and you'll discharge that capacitor, okay? And that's important to discharge it before you test it. 
And by the way, a charge capacitor, you know, one that has a full charge, yeah, it's going to create a pretty impressive uh, spark uh, when you cross those terminals with that screwdriver. But at the same time, you know, if you don't get that great big spark, uh, that lack of spark, that doesn't mean that the capacitor is bad. Rather, it just may not have a full charge. So nonetheless, what we're doing now, we get it off the motor, we got the wires off of it, and we discharge the capacitor. So now the capacitor is ready to be tested. Okay? So to test the capacitor, we're going to set the meter. It doesn't matter whether it's analog or digital. We're going to set it over there to the ohm setting. Showed you that a little earlier. I set it on the ohm set. And then as we uh, um, connect the, our, our, our two probes to those two terminals, so connect the multimeter probes to the terminals on the capacitor. Note, keep the probes connected for several seconds, okay? And this is what we should see. On the analog meter, if you happen to use an analog meter, uh, the needle, this needle here, will start to climb. Um, at a very, very low reading and will climb steadily towards infinity. Now, infinity is what, if you take the probes on your multimeter and you, you cross those probes, you will get an infinity reading in your meter. That infinity can be displayed one of two ways. It can either be an OL, that's infinity, or it can simply be a 1, that's also infinity. But what you're looking at here, when you're looking at this capacitor, again, the needle will start to climb from the low end and will climb steadily towards uh, uh, towards infinity as the capacitor recharges, okay, as the capacitor recharges. If the capacitor is bad, the needle will not move at all, okay? Another pretty uh, uh, black and white test that we can perform on a, on a, a capacitor. If we're using a digital meter, uh, again, if the capacitor is good, uh, the number displayed will increase until the capacitor discharges, and then it will go back to zero. So on a digital meter, you'll see those values climb up, and then they'll fall back. That basically tells you that you've charged the capacitor and discharged the capacitor. In this case, if the capacitor is bad, uh, the values uh, or the needle won't move much at all. Uh, or it's just going to read very, very low resistance. That's going to tell you you got a bad capacity. That thing ought to go all the way to infinity and then swing back. That's what you're looking for. That's where the capacitor is located. Again, this is a little tighter shot. It's on the back side of this terminal block here that you see. And uh, there's your, your terminals there. Uh, the thing I'd like to point out is this white window. Uh, really good visual, really. Uh, if a capacitor vents, which is what they're designed to do and adverse situations. That white window that I'm showing you there it probably won't be there. Uh, what will be in its place is a black, oozy looking, tarry looking material that oozes out that window. That's a little vent port right there. So again, that's a quick visual. If that window's intact, there's a pretty good chance that capacitor is probably good. But uh, if that window's not there, then uh, no sense even testing that capacitor because it's an indication. It's, it's already shot. So when we look at capacitors, um, we want to discharge the capacitor and place the probes on each terminal simultaneously. The needle moves to infinity, then returns. That's what we're looking for. But if that needle doesn't move or moves very, very little, uh, that's going to indicate that we have a bad capacitor. All right, these are the two publications that I've got for you. Um, a copy of my chart, a copy of the uh, uh, the uh, resistance values um, are on the left-hand side, and that's a, uh, that's a PDF download for you. And then over on the right-hand side is a little more detailed, I guess, uh, on how to go ahead and test that capacitor. Uh, the important things I have there are in red font. So, uh, But anyway, uh, I think that's pretty much to the end of my slides for the day. I do appreciate everybody taking the time and joining us. All during the month of June, all new topics. So check that web schedule on our website and hope to see you back here next week. If you travel, travel safe, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you very much. This training has now concluded.